Well, good morning to you all. It's good to see you here in church or see that bit of your faces, which I can see. Uh, We'll be thinking about veiled faces later on in the service. Uh, If this is your first time here, and indeed, if it's not your first time here, but perhaps a wee bit of a reminder, just to say that at the end of the service, I'll leave the sanctuary here. And if you can wait till the stewards tell you to move. That's just so that we can keep the people flow uh, going the right way. I have the results of the vote on the basis of union that uh, most of you, if not all of you, will have voted on. These are the votes. I'll not read all the statistics we were given. This is the simple voting. Galashiels Trinity votes. I'll not read all the statistics we were given. This is the simple voting. Galashiels Trinity voted for the union, 213 against nine, and there was one abstention. Galashiels Old Parish and St. Paul's voted for the union, 127 against 14, and Galashiels St. John's voted for the union 89 against eight. And so that's a clear vote for the union in all three churches. The opinions of the consultant architect who carried out a feasibility study on the future of the church buildings are available. And if you would like to see them, there's nothing secret about the report and you can get a copy by asking uh, any secret about the report and you can get a copy by asking uh, any elder or board member for the copy. This matter will now be dealt with by presbytery this week and in connection with that I have this edict from the presbytery to read. At the meeting of Presbytery on Tuesday the 4th of May 2021 at 7 p.m. by Zoom, the Presbytery Planning Implementation Committee will report on the outcome of the vote of the congregations of Galashiels Old and St. Paul's, Galashiels St. John's and Galashiels Trinity on the proposed basis of union of these congregations. Should the congregations vote in favor of the basis of union, which you have, Presbytery will be invited to give its approval of the basis of union in any event or to implement another course of action. An appeal against the decision of Presbytery can only be raised during the Presbytery meeting by a Kirk session or members of the Presbytery and only on certain procedural grounds. The three congregations are hereby cited to attend the above meeting of presbytery for their own interest. This means that any member of the congregations may attend the meeting of presbytery and may speak but not vote on the presbytery's consideration of the basis of union. If you would like to attend, the Zoom invitation link can be obtained from the interim moderator, David's here. It will be helpful if the interim moderator would let the presbytery clerk know the names of those planning to attend to ensure that the Zoom system allows admittance to the meeting. What that means is admittance to the meeting. What that means is if you want to go to the Presbytery meeting to hear how Presbytery deals with the vote and moves things forward, you have a right to and ask David for the details of joining the Zoom meeting, but you don't have to go if you don't want to. One uh, more thing, Christian Aid Week is going to be somewhat constrained this uh, year, but if you would like uh, an envelope uh, for uh, giving to Christian Aid, then have a word with me uh, as you're leaving the church. Now, I think these are all the notices. So let us worship God. We begin with a very spirited singing of Psalm in the worship 
Psalm 98 to the tune Lingham. Let's pray. Holy God, we bow in your presence and we rejoice simply because we can be here and join together and offer to you our praise. We long for that day when not only may we open our lips in praise, here, but when face to face we will see you and offer to you all our thanksgiving and adoration for all that you are and for all that you have done for us. You are a great God and a gracious God. You are a tender God and a merciful God. You are a powerful God. You are a wise God fills the whole of your creation. And we, humble image bearers of the living God, come to you and in quietness and contemplation we marvel at all you have done for us. For you have blessed us in so many different ways. You have provided for our needs. The fact that we walked into this building is a testimony 
to what you have done for us and what you have given to us. And we thank you because you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. But above all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who came to sh who came to show us how we might live in a way that pleases you, who has revealed to us the truth about what the world is, how it exists, why we are here, who is the life that we may have through faith in Him, a life that outlives death itself, because He has vanquished even death by His death on the cross and given us a new and living hope by His resurrection. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would come to us now and you would speak to us in your word. And as you speak, give us ears to hear and wills that respond here and wills that respond that our lives might shine something of your glory for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, our reading, first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34. And um, we have to wear face masks. This is about someone in the Bible who had to wear a face mask. But it was for a different reason from the reason we've got. So look at the Bible as we go through it. Pay attention because I'm going to ask you a question at the end of the reading. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> you weren't expecting that. <laughs> right. Exodus chapter 34 at verse 1. I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or to be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two, the two stone tablets in his hands. And then moving forward to verse 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from the mountains, from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him and, gave them, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But when but whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites that he had, what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Amen. So why did Moses wear face covering?
There's someone dying to answer up here. <laughs> That's right, because his face was shining because he'd been so close to God. You know, in this life, we can't get near to God because we're so different from God. But Moses, they were really frightened by what they saw. And so when Moses had been speaking with the Lord, he would put a mask on his face. And the only time he took it off was when he went back to speak to the Lord again. Now that didn't happen forever with Moses. But when he had this very close meeting with God, it shone on his face. And those who live very close to God, well, it shines on their face sometimes too. And the New Testament tells us that one day, all of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ will be like Moses without the veil on the face, without the face covering, and we will shine the glory of God. I have no idea what that will be like, but it sounds really quite exciting to me. Now we're going to have another uh, song, Eternal Light, Eternal Light. Moving on then to our second reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3 at verse 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 1.
Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but for God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was... Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. We thank God for his word and pray that he'll help us to understand it. Just before we take a look at that passage, uh, we hear the hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God.
There's a neat little transition that Paul does between chapters 2 and 3 of 2 Corinthians. Of course, he didn't write in chapters, but it just helps us that there is a verse that links his thinking. Sometimes, you know, Paul gets caught up in these ideas which are so exciting to him. His mind runs on and and we find it a little bit difficult to say, whoa, where did that come from? So here's here's the little link. It's in the last verse of chapter 2. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. You know, when you get conflicts in church, they often revolve around who the boss is, who's, who's got the authority, who's going to set those sent from God. You know, when you get conflicts in church, they often revolve around who the boss is, who's, who's got the authority, who's going to set the agenda, who's going to make the decisions about what happens. And that's where disgruntlement so often finds because people are arguing about who the boss is. And Paul, as I said last week, was having to put up with these people he calls the super apostles, the people who thought they were so much better than him, much flashier individuals, um, regarded themselves as very powerful uh, ministers of something or other, and who were leading the Corinthians astray. And the issue for the right has Paul got to tell you what to do. You don't have to listen to Paul. Why don't you listen to us instead? And they would say that they had an authority, and they would often say, people have given us letters. Now, if, if, you, if you think back to when we worked through Acts, you remember that before Paul was converted to Christ, he went to Jerusalem to get letters of authority to persecute the church. And we see in Corinth this was still going on. These super apostles, whoever they were, were going to get letters of authority. And they said, Paul's not got any letters of authority. Paul's had nothing to do with the authorities since he became a Christian. And so Paul begins chapter 3 by asking Paul begins chapter 3 by asking two questions. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Do we need letters of recommendation to you or from you? And the way he puts these questions in the language he wrote in, they expect the answer no. And the reason he expects the answer is no is he doesn't need a letter of authority from anyone. He knew deep within his heart that his authority had come from God when Jesus, risen from the dead, revealed himself to Paul. But, he says, I do have a letter And this is his letter, verse 2. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And Paul does this thing to to explain this a bit more, that he loves to, he loves setting up contrasts. And he says, here's the legalist's view of the world. The legalist has got to have a letter of authority. The legalist has got to show that someone somewhere who someone thinks is important has given this person a certificate which says that they can now go and do something. And it's all to do with this authority. And that's the legalist's view 
of the world, its view of the world. And their view of authority is something heavy, chiseled out of stone like the Ten Commandments themselves. And Paul says, here's the contrast. Here is the Christian life, the life in the Spirit, when the Spirit of God Himself comes and He writes the gospel on human hearts. That's an old, old image. It's the fulfillment of what the prophet said. For example, Jeremiah This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33. Do one evidence of my, one evidence of my authority, Paul says. Well, here it is. Look at the church in Corinth. And if you want a detailed look, you can go back later on and have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now look at the people who make up this Corinthian church. There are people sitting in church who had been thieves. There were people who had been so greedy for gain There were people who are sexually immoral in so many different ways. There were people who had peddled all sorts of false religions. They'd been caught up in all the temple worship. They'd made money out of that. There were people who had set up elaborate scams and robbed people like that. Scams and robbed people like that. In fact, as you look at the church in Corinth and you see the people there, you Corinthians will recognize that there are people there who practiced every sort of unrighteousness. And if you looked at them in a spirit of judgment, you would say, here are people who did not deserve ever to get within a million miles of heaven. Such was their lifestyle. How does Paul go on? Does he say that he went there and said, now you folk, you really need to keep the law of God more. And you men, we want you to join the men's group. And women, stop doing what you're doing. There's a knitting circle opening on Tuesday afternoons. You can't know. He said nothing of the sort. He says, 1 Corinthians 6.11, You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here they are. These people who are the church in Corinth, who had indulged in every conceivable sort of sin, and now they were in church And they had been made into new creatures. They had been washed clean of their sin. They'd been made holy by God. And this was something God had done in Christ by the activity of the Holy Spirit. And this is what the church exists to do. It exists to declare in Jesus Christ. To say to people, are you caught up in this mess in your life? Is is this sin one that haunts you and torments you? Is, Is this temptation always before you and you feel so powerless against it? It doesn't The church doesn't go, here's a whole load of rules and you'll be all right if you keep these rules. It says, here is Jesus Christ. And he paid the penalty of that sin. And he has lived the price of that sin in his own body when he died on the cross. And that's the job of the church, Paul is saying to the Corinthians. It's to write that message on human hearts. 
and not to get caught up in it's to write that message on human hearts and not to get caught up in things and activities. There's a writer called Ian Bounds. Everyone should read at least one book by Ian Bounds. doesn't matter which one because he wrote, I think it was eight books on prayer and it isn't really eight different books. It's one book he wrote eight different times, but there's nothing new about authors who do that. But I've got a few quotations. I want you to bear in mind he wrote this, oh, 150 years ago. The present-day church is filled with machinery, organizations, committees, and societies, so much so that the power it has is altogether insufficient to run the machinery or furnish the life sufficient to do all this external work. For saints to run them, the simplest organization may aid purity as well as strength, but beyond that narrow limit, organization swallows up the individual and is careless of personal purity. Push, activity, enthusiasm, zeal for an organization come as the vicious substitutes for spiritual character. By dint of machinery, new organizations and spiritual weakness Results are vainly expected to be secured, which can only be secured by faith, prayer, and waiting on God. One more quote. We are constantly on a stretch, if not a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency the church and secure enlargement and efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man or sink the man in the plan or organization. God's plan is to make much of the man far more of him than anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more or novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. It does not come on machinery, but on men. It does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. And this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. Come on machinery, but on men. It does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. And this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. For him, ministry is not about fame or importance, which his enemies were looking for, nor is it about glorifying himself as the servant of God. Ministry in both the Old and the New Covenant is about the glory of God. And he says, in setting up this contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant between Moses and the Christian ministry. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved on letters and stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was. You know, we live in a time when everyone is an expert on everything and, and every opinion is valid no matter how ill-informed it might be. So the idea that God should actually choose certain human endeavors to reflect his glory sounds just to the modern ear so elitist. It sounds so exclusive. But you see, Paul is not setting out a, an opinion he's got. He's looking at the history of God's dealing with people. And he, he thinks of the ministry of Moses and the ministry of the other apostles and himself. And he says, the giving of the law 
was never something that would save people but it was still surrounded by the but it was still surrounded by the glory of God himself and Paul writes elsewhere in his letters a great deal about the law and he holds the law up in such esteem esteem that he thinks it is a glorious thing because it's part of God's revelation of himself because it's good because it gives us a way of living it has an important function in the world and in the church but the law can do nothing this is the problem with legalism here's an illustration you're driving along or you're riding on a bus and you look out of the front and coming up by the side of the road is a big red disc like this with a white bar across the middle. And you know what that means? It means no entry. It's a road traffic sign. It represents a road traffic regulation, a bit of the law. Now all that sign is doing is saying, don't go this way. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say what will happen if you do. It just says you're heading the wrong way. Don't go this way. Now it might be that you're about to go the wrong way down a one-way street or that at the end of the road there's a huge reservoir and you could drive your car into it. Or it might be that it's actually private property and you've got no right to be on that road. The law doesn't justify itself, it just is. No entry, don't go this way. But suppose you've got one of these clever, clever drivers who knows that this is a shortcut. And so they ignore the sign and they head down the road and crash. There's a war shortcut. And so they ignore the sign and they head down the road and crash. There's a wall they hadn't seen. And so much for thinking you know better than the law. And here's how that story goes on. From this point on, that sign is useless. The sign is not going to scrape your car off the wall. The sign is not going to dial 999 and get help for you. The sign won't get you out of the car. It was a good sign. It was a helpful sign. Your life would have been better if you'd taken note of the sign. But now it's powerless to help. And the law is good. And the law is good. And the law is helpful. But if you look to the law to save you, well, this was the problem for the Jews. And Paul goes on in verse 14. Their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. You go back to what we call the Old Testament and you read it. It only takes you so far. And it may be that you've tried to read the Bible and it just seems so opaque to you, so difficult. What is it saying? It's like trying to read it. So how do we get rid of the veil? And Paul says it's not been removed for those who are relying on the law because only in Christ is it taken away. And a bit further on, verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And he says this is the big difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. They both show the glory of God. But the old covenant only takes you so far. And now in Jesus Christ, who is the Lord, the Holy Spirit, who is also the Lord, will come 
and He opens our eyes to see the glory of God, and He opens our hearts to receive the good news in our hearts, and He opens our eyes to see the glory of God and He opens our hearts to receive the good news in our hearts. And so Paul sums up this work by saying, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Any religion can easily become legalism. And indeed, I incline to the view that most non-Christian religions are in one way or another just legalism. The good news, as Jesus come and dealt with our sin on the cross, but the Holy Spirit comes and applies that to our hearts, to our minds, to our wills, to our lives. And He makes us shine with the gospel. You know what's lovely about the story of Moses is Moses did not know he was shining with the glory of God. It was only when he got there and everyone was going, Aah! and he would say, what's the matter with you? And his brother said, Moses, have you seen your face? Well, no, he hadn't. Mirrors hadn't been invented. So there was no chance of him having seen his own face. He says, you've got to cover your face. There's such a shining coming from you. And as we walk with the Lord, as we ask him to rise it from one degree of glory to another, and that, he says, is my authority to declare that to you and to be able to say to my opponents, look at these changed lives. That is the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, we bow in your presence and marvel at that grace that should have chosen to come to people in all our brokenness and our disobedience and our waywardness, and not only to reveal your way in the law, but to write your way in our hearts by the ministry of the Holy Spirit our hearts by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And with that in mind, we pray first for the church, that despite all the demands and pressures on us set by society and the way things are changing in our world, we may faithfully declare the good news of all that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would help us to encourage one another to speak your word to one another, to address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, that we might together grow in grace and the knowledge of your love and shine glory. We pray for all that will be taking place in coming months, and we pray for those who are elders and ministers of word and sacrament that together in sessions and presbytery you would show us a way forward, a way that will be good for our young people and our old people, a way that will glorify you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to lay aside all the weights and hindrances and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. 
Heavenly Father, you have put us into a family of people bound together by your love for us in Jesus Christ. In the quiet, in the quiet we hold each other up to you now. We are grateful that you know us all. You know the different hurts and concerns we have, the anxieties and regrets, the fears and the delights. And we ask that you would bind us together as a family, healing those who are broken in body or mind, giving light where there is only dimness at the moment, so that we, with unveiled faces, will one day shine with the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn, How Shall I Sing That Majesty? And at the end of the hymn, I'll say the benediction.
Go in peace in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.